Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome. Um, <clears throat> my name is Joe Brosnan. I'm a member of the Justice Group here in the Institute. And uh, Nora Owen, who normally chairs the group, uh, can't be with us today, so I'm deputising for, for Nora. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping points. First of all, would you please uh, switch your phones off or power them off? Um, if you want to tweet, that's fine. Um, as long as your phone is on silent um, and the handle is at IIEA um, the address by Marie will be on the record it's up to you whether you want the question answered to be on the record yeah, yeah. Oh, you, don't you don't mind? I don't yeah, mind fine, yeah. um, and uh, that, that, that says we having to go into the Chatham House rules yes there will be no Chatham House rules today um, <coughs> So our speaker today is Dr. Marie de Sommer. Um, she's head of the Migration and Diversity Programme at the European Policy Centre in Brussels, uh, with a specific focus on EU family reunification, asylum law, and the Schengen Free Movement area. She's also a guest professor at the Catholic University of Leuven, uh, where she teaches EU human rights law. And prior to joining the EPC, she worked at the European Commission, uh, Maastricht University, and the other prominent think tank on European matters in Brussels, SEPS. Um, <clears throat> in her address today, she will um, give an overview of developments in relation to refugees and to asylum applications in Europe and in particular the difficulties that have arisen for the operation of the Dublin regulation uh, on the issue of which member states should um, be responsible for examining asylum applications and also on the, the impact of, on the operation of the Schengen area of borderless free movement of persons. So this is in a way perhaps a, a somewhat technical aspect of one of the big problems that is facing Europe at the moment and um, is, you know, at the centre of, of politics in Europe at the moment. And the fact that it's technical or, uh, or legal in nature doesn't lessen its importance. In fact, it's quite central to the, to the whole issue and, and to where we go from here in terms of trying to deal with the issue of, of the refugee influx into Europe. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Marie. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the kind invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here uh, and to talk to you uh, about what I think is a very complex set of issues. Uh, so as introduced, I'll be speaking about Dublin and I'll also be uh, looking at the problems in the Schengen area, introducing how they are uh, interlinked. Um, very briefly on those problems uh, and to sketch a bit uh, of an overview there, the Schengen Free Movement Area to begin with has in fact not been border control free now for over three years. Uh, we saw the first reintroduction of border controls in September 2015 by Germany. Uh, Germany was followed by Austria uh, and then later on and in that respective order uh, the following countries did the same Slovenia, France, Hungary, Sweden, Norway, Denmark and Belgium. Um, out of these nine countries six have continued to continuously reintroduce what were supposed to be only temporary controls since then. Those six are Austria, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany and France. And most recently, so earlier this month, those six countries have also again given a notification to the European Commission that they will again be uh, re-extending these border controls now uh, for a period running up to November 2019. So, uh, sadly, uh, we will soon be seeing in September 2019 the fourth anniversary of uh, border controls in the Schengen Free Movement Area. On the Dublin side, the situation is equally problematic, I would say. Um, the Dublin regulation, as already mentioned, uh, <coughs> organizes, amongst other things, which country is responsible for dealing with an asylum application. 
and has been the subject of very heated, extremely antagonistic debates amongst member states, also since, by and large, uh, the summer and fall of 2015. At the moment, after more than three years of very intense uh, debates and, 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 again, very antagonistic debates, the political deadlock is uh, complete. In February 2019, the last EU presidency to work on the file, which was the Romanian presidency, definitively threw in the towel, stating we, we cannot make any progress anymore before the European Parliament elections, which we have now just had. So I would like to address today two questions. Uh, first, how exactly did we get here? Where do these problems come from? And second, how can we move forward? Uh, to manage expectations, I will not, unfortunately, be providing the definitive solutions here uh, in my answer to that second uh, question. I will instead elaborate on two scenarios that I think are currently quite dominant in uh, policy-making circles, both in Brussels as at the national level. Uh, I'll provide my comments on them, uh, highlighting what I think can be improved or should be done uh, instead. Uh, but before getting there, and, and as uh, uh, highlighted, I would first like to give an overview of how we got there, where do the problems come from, how are they also interlinked, because I think it's crucial to inform any understanding uh, and any thoughts on how to move forward from there. I will not elaborate in doing so on the migration developments in 2015 and 2016, because I imagine this audience is quite uh, familiar with them. Short recap would be that in those years, Europe received over 1.2 million people annually um, filing asylum claims, which was by and large double the amount which we were receiving in the period uh, of 2010 up to 2014, and constituted in any case the largest uh, inflow of refugees to Europe since the Second World War. While these events and exceptionally large numbers, of course, provide the context to and certainly mark the start of the manifestation of the problems I described at the outset. They are not, in my view, the actual root cause or the source of the current difficulties. Um, I actually think that what happened in 2015-2016 was only uh, un <coughs> the uncovering of problems that were already there. And I mean this specifically in relation to Dublin system, which in my view, has embedded from its earliest conception uh, here in Dublin in 1999, the, the first Dublin Convention, now a regulation, has embedded a structurally asymmetric design in assigning responsibility over refugees among EU member states. To briefly uh, elaborate on these rules, generally uh, they provide that the member state that is responsible is the one to which an asylum seeker holds <coughs> prior links and such prior links can be expressed, for instance, through the presence of family members in that member state, possession of a visa or residence permits, um, or prior states, prior states in that state. The default rule, however, which is the rule that applies when none of those criteria are met, establishes that the responsibility for an asylum claim resides with the state through which the asylum seeker first entered the EU. The default rule is the use that the rule that is uh, at current most frequently applied, because most asylum seekers do not actually have any prior uh, links with the member states. And this is problematic because that <coughs> default rule places a disproportionate share of responsibility on those states located at the EU's external border and for that reason constituting most obvious first entry points. How did we gets to such a poor design and how is it possible that we never addressed this in the long period that has followed since between 1999 and uh, 2015. Two elements are important there, I think. Um, firstly, the problems in the very beginning, and that is a period that I define as roughly running up to the mid 2000s, the problems with that system didn't manifest themselves. Uh, we should also bear in mind that the Dublin Convention was signed in 1999, which means that the discussions on that Dublin Convention predate 1999, hence they, were, uh, they took place in the 1980s, when Europe actually did not have many spontaneous arrivals amongst others because of the fact that we still had the Iron Curtain uh, in place at that time. And this is 
at least part of the explanation as to why, to put it very simply, policymakers simply did not spend sufficient thoughts on how the system would operate if and when large and larger migrant arrivals would be registered. From the early 1990s onwards, of course, the situation changed. We did see the end of the Iron Curtain, and with that, we did also see migration movements uh, to Europe rising, particularly from east to west in the context of the political turbulence after the dissolution of the Soviet bloc. Still, however, the Dublin system did not pose any problems, because at that time, the state at the external border uh, from the point of view of the migration movements going east to west was still Germany. Uh, on the one hand, Germany was the uh, so the Germany was the country first arrival and was also the country of preferred destination for many of those asylum seekers at that time. So there was no need for what are currently very problematic uh, Dublin transfers, and of course Germany was also a country which, because of its size and its economy, uh, had quite a bit of possibility to observe this these newcomers with uh, a degree of, of relative ease. Um, so up until the mid-2000s, I think the reason as to why the system continued to be in place is because it wasn't posing any problems. And this changed uh, as from the mid-2000s onwards, and with that, of course, problems as problems became visible. Uh, two reasons account for why we saw problems then. Uh, to begin with, and straightforwardly, uh, migration flows to Europe started increasing and diversifying, including increased movements from the African continent uh, to then arriving in uh, southern European countries. In addition, the EU's external borders also shifted uh, with the 2004 accession of eight central and eastern European countries, moving that border eastward, and uh, to a lesser extent also southward with the accession of Cyprus and Malta in that same year. And this is how and when we saw the first cracks in the system. can't provide a, um, an exhaustive overview of that cracks, but just to give a bit of an... Um, to give a flavor with some examples. For instance, in Eastern Europe, already immediately in the mid-2000s, we had uh, frequent observations, frequent reports of uh, receptions conditions being so structurally overwhelmed uh, that there were uh, structural also hunger strikes by uh, asylum seekers uh, in protest of the conditions they were uh, living in. In the south, similarly, we observed overcrowded facilities, particularly on the Canary Islands in Malta and then of course as well in Italy and Greece leading, amongst others, later on to the famous MSS case by the European Court of Human Rights, the first of a line of case law to follow, uh, precluding <coughs> continued Dublin transfers back to those countries because the conditions were found to be so problematic that they amounted to uh, degrading treatment as prohibited by Article 3 uh, ECHR. So, the problems were there as from the mid-2000s onwards. Why were they not addressed? Uh, it was certainly not due to the fact that there were no reform exercises taking place. It was also not due to the fact that there were no complaints or no pressure uh, from the countries, particularly in uh, Southern Europe. The main reason, and at the risk of simplification, but the main reason, generally speaking, is that at the time, the Northern Western European states had an interest in retaining the status quo as it stood, and their political weight in the context of council decision making in that respect uh, was definitive in blocking any meaningful reforms to that responsibility sharing uh, system. Uh, so first because of the early poor design and second because of the absence of any meaningful political will to reform that rule what I think we witnessed in 2015 and 2016 was a system that collapsed under its own weight because of poor design, once it was faced with the uh, with larger arrival numbers and actually needed to start operating at a larger scale. So 2015-2016, the already under-resourced reception condition facilities in Eastern and Southern Europe became structurally overwhelmed, which resulted in mass secondary movements of asylum seekers from those countries to Northern and Western European states, particularly to Sweden and Germany and providing us with the images uh, that we're familiar with of people walking for days in deplorable conditions, being stuck in train or bus stations, uh, etc. 
Um, so the collapse was triggered by the exceptionally high numbers, but its structural reasons reside foremost in the lack of political will and concert, concerted action to address the flaw earlier. I leave Dublin there for a bit, I'll come back to it, and I want to now explain you why we continued, why we started seeing uh, problems in the Schengen area at that same time. Uh, I want to argue there that those problems in the Schengen area also stem from that structural design flaw that has marked the Dublin system from its uh, very beginning. But their perpetuation today, however, is the result of political choices that I think are ill-advised. <laughs> I'll explain first by highlighting how Dublin and Schengen have, in essence, always been interlinked. Um, the Dublin system, and as likely uh, many of you are aware, but, but just to recap, has actually originate, originated out of the discussions that marked the creation of the Schengen Free Border, border Free Zone. So the original Schengen Agreement, as is well known, was signed in 1985 by three Benelux countries plus Germany and France. And in 1985, immigration was not yet a big concern. There were only three articles devoted to it at the time. However, in the discussions that followed uh, in the run-up to what would become the Schengen Implementing Convention on the exact rules and uh, procedures on lifting these controls, immigration did become a concern. More specifically, policymakers at the time feared that if they were to abolish internal controls, they would be faced with a security loss in terms of migration control. And in order to address this, they uh, felt the need to adopt compensatory or flanking measures. Uh, so member states reflected first on measures to strengthen what would now become a common external border. And second, they were also worried about a potential increase in so-called asylum shopping movements, whereby in a border-free zone, asylum seekers would lodge their claims either in multiple states or would move from one state to another in the event of an unfavorable application, uh, to, uh, event of an unfavorable response to their application. And so, as you can see, these two concerns uh, were then later on reflected in the Dublin Convention signed in the same year as the Schengen Implementing Convention in 1999, providing to begin with that uh, the <coughs> common external border uh, had to be uh, controlled with, with more force and uh, that there should be rules on how to allocate responsibility for asylum seekers in the common space as already highlighted. It's important uh, to keep that original logic in mind because in essence what I think happened in 2015 and why the Schengen system uh, also got into trouble is because there was a spillover from the problems in the Dublin system that I described into the Schengen system and that spillover I believe followed the exact same pathway that was the one uh, that led to the creation of Dublin out of uh, the discussions on Schengen, however in the opposite direction. I'm a bit abstract here, I will explain it uh, better. After the system's factual collapse and in the face of the huge secondary movements that we were witnessing in 2015 and 2016, and the clear evidence as well that Southern and Eastern Europe were no longer coping with the arrival uh, numbers, the next important moment and developments in, in that state of affairs at the time was the German government's decision to suspend Dublin returns for Syrian refugees back to uh, states at the external border. So Angela Merkel's famous Wir schaffen das moment, which of course can't uh, be left aside in, in an overview here. Um, this moment is often, and in my view incorrectly, described as an opening of the borders. It was instead only a decision to suspend the Dublin returns from Germany back to countries at the uh, external border, which would in any case have been extremely difficult. And in fact, what is striking is that the outcome was really not an opening of the borders, it was the opposite, it was the start of uh, reintroduce, reintroduced border controls. Because following that decision to suspend domestic returns, Angela Merkel in Germany started facing increasing uh, domestic uh, political pressure particularly stemming from Bavarian uh, politicians of the CSU party. The Bavarian federal state in Germany had actually been dealing with high numbers of, arrival numbers that, of arrivals that were entering its state via the land border with Austria. And amongst others, in response, 
the finance, the Bavarian finance minister at the time and CSU politician Markus Söder publicly stated that when the EU's external borders are not protected, the German government needs to think about how it will protect the German borders. And that's where the logic is reversed. So we needed Dublin because of, uh, <coughs> in order to provide compensatory measures of Schengen. And now the statement was, if uh, the Dublin operation is not fully functional, we have to rewind uh, Schengen. But the logic is essentially the same. And it's also what happened then, uh, two weeks uh, after Angela Merkel's first, de first decision to um, uh, stop the returns, uh, internal border checks were introduced because of the domestic pressure uh, at the German-Austrian land borders. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, this led to a sort of domino effect. Austria followed, Slovenia followed. Uh, those countries originally wanted to avoid becoming sort of dead ends where migrants, from where migrants could no longer travel on. In total, nine countries followed and um, six countries continued to have that control in place up until today. The justification adduced at the time was a fear of secondary movements of asylum seekers. Already then, you can raise questions as to whether some countries then reinstating internal border controls is a structural answer that would have been needed to address those uh, secondary movements, but at least it can't be disputed that there were in fact large numbers of such secondary movements. However, arrival numbers have actually started decreasing strongly as from mid-2016, and at current we are actually back to pre-2015 levels of arrivals for the EU as a whole. And we also know, and that has been reported on by the European Commission, that the secondary movements as a result have in parallel become limited. Nevertheless, and strikingly, the recent justifications adduced, including the one it, um, put forward this month of May, still refer to a fierce effect of secondary movements or to a security situation uh, at the uh, external border. Some member state politicians explain this weird justification by claiming that even if secondary movements are no longer there, there is still a legitimate fear of such movements taking up again in the future because large numbers <coughs> of migrants remain present in Italy and Greece. But then we cannot address this continued pressure without uh, reforming the Dublin system. So in that way, the debate also comes full circle, or at least we are talking in uh, circles. What I think explains the continued internal border controls better than actual uh, fear of secondary movements at this stage uh, is their symbolic value and the instrumentalization of that symbolic value to give the impression of um, advancing a very tough immigration control policy. I won't go further into detail there, but I'm very interested to potentially discuss that uh, with you in the, in the Q&A session. For now, what I hope to have done is to already give an answer to how did we get here. Uh, I'll take less time for the next question, uh, which is how do we move on? Uh, and there I would like, <laughs> as, as already mentioned, to discuss two scenarios with you, uh, which I have selected on the personal impression that they are currently the most uh, dominant one, the mo dominant ones, the most uh, discussed ones. Uh, <coughs> as also already mentioned, I'm not convinced by either. I'm actually quite critical of both of them. Uh, I'll outline why that is the case. And then as it's of course easier to say what is wrong than to say what should be done instead, I really will also try to make an effort uh, to provide uh, some alternatives. The first scenario is the one that has been in the running the longest, although in uh, different kinds of formats. It's a scenario that can be uh, entitled flexible solidarity. That's also what uh, it has been named by some of its proponents. And it encompasses the idea that instead of taking on refugees from those member states who are currently overburdened, um, the other member states can help by providing um, stronger financial aid or in other ways, um, in operational terms, by contributing to uh, border control measures either in that <coughs> overburdened state or in the context of uh, relations and cooperation with uh, origins of uh, um, um, 
countries of origin and or transit. This scenario was uh, first proposed, uh, I believe, somewhere in 2016 by the four Visegrad countries, and they have also since remained uh, its most vocal proponent. These four countries are also the countries that have, from the very start, refused any reform of the Dublin system that would address the design flaw by providing a mechanism through which uh, refugees would be moved or relocated in policy terms from the overburdened states to other member states, typically states in Northern Western Europe or Eastern Europe. Um, they do not oppose such schemes and, and also to, to give the full uh, picture there, if premised on voluntary uh, quotas of refugees, so if they can choose how many they will take on, they oppose the idea that uh, such a scheme would be automatic and would have mandatory uh, quotas. What originally was a bit striking to me or, or puzzling when I, when the opposition first became clear is that, and, and maybe to you too, at least three out of those four Visegrad countries, uh, notably Poland, Slovakia and Hungary, are themselves countries at the external border, so they should have an interest in um, reforming and addressing the Dublin system so that it has so that it places less responsibility on the countries at the external border. However, and what explains their opposition to some extent is that following extremely controversial and uh, criticized policy practices, including the building of fences and walls along their external border, these countries are currently no longer experiencing the high arrival numbers they were experiencing in 2015 and 2016. And their argumentation has, has been since uh, that they cannot be expected to now participate in a relocation scheme that would be automatic and mandatory if a similar control is not established along the southern frontiers. Uh, so it's that, and as mentioned, they've come up with several proposals which they call flexible solidarity, increasing financial support, increasing operational support, but not being obliged to taking refugees. Uh, following the change in government, Austria, uh, changing government in late 2017. Austrian government has also uh, started advocating for such schemes and uh, other countries too. However, these proposals have to date, and, and as, I started, as I stated at the beginning, not been successful. We are and continue to be at a complete political deadlock to begin with. And as is of course obvious, they were strongly opposed by the countries in, uh, by several countries in the Southern uh, European sphere. In addition, and quite vocally, German Chancellor Mer Merkel has consistently also uh, opposed such flexible solidarity ideas. She stated that they would amount to selective solidarity and that that would never be the way forward. It was therefore very surprising and in the latest developments on this kind of scenario uh, when, that we witnessed a shift in this German uh, position in December 2018 through a leaked paper uh, that was actually authored by both Germany as well as France, in which they indicated a new line, uh, much more aligned to the Visegrad IDs, stating that uh, governments would still be obliged to take asylum seekers from other EU member states, but exceptions could be made if countries made alternative measures of uh, solidarity. As was Quite clear why we saw that change in December 2018 was because of the urgency of still trying to move forward and still trying to come to uh, some sort of a consensus um, in ahead of the European Parliament elections that we have just had. But as I mentioned, in spite of this uh, change uh, in the German Franco position, uh, we did not uh, manage to come to any sort of agreement. agreement. My views on this, while I agree that, the way that we really urgently need a reform, I don't think uh, we should be moving towards a flexible solidarity scheme premised on voluntary quota. I think such voluntary quota, and as the opposition to the mandatory quota also by definition shows, will likely not amount to very many actual relocation commitments, so will likely not help the plight of the southern member states. Uh, compensatory measures, both financially and operationally, are already provided to date and in quite significant ways, but have not and continue not to provide the solution. What the evolution of the Dublin system shows us, and why I also spent quite some time uh, on, on highlighting that to you, is that we can actually not afford not regressing that earlier flaw. 
It may be difficult, it may take a long time, but I don't think there are any alternatives. It's because of the previous unwillingness to address the flaw when we registered the first cracks to the systems in the early and the mid 2000s that the EU was caught unprepared uh, in 2015, 2016. If we continue to provide a half hearty solution and push the larger question away back into the future, uh, it will amount to repetition of the mistakes we have made in the past and we will continue to greater or to smaller extents but always there uh, dif to see difficulties in the operation uh, of the system. So I would argue that we need to continue investing all political capital available in moving towards a Dublin system that rectifi rectifies this earlier design flaw, provides for a solid responsibility sharing mechanism including one that is automatic and provides for mandatory quotas. I would add that it will not be enough. I also believe, and I'm happy to be challenged on that afterwards, that we need to think about providing a degree of choice to asylum seekers as to where they would want to uh, go to, not unlimitedly. Uh, we can put several conditions in place. We can look at which countries have not uh, received large shares already. Uh, but some kind of a system along these lines. This is not a novel idea, it's also not my idea. It is already part of the current European Parliament report on the Dublin reforms. Uh, that report has such a system in place. It might not be a perfect system, mm -hmm. but the idea behind it that we should provide for some choice is a good one, I think. Furthermore, a bit more controversially, I think after having uh, received the recognition of the refugee status, we may also need to consider whether we do not want to move towards a system where there is at least some free movement rights or opportunities for recognized refugees, perhaps again not unlimitedly, but something more than what currently could be achieved through the long-term residence directive. As a third element, we need to move towards further harmonization of uh, asylum uh, procedure, uh, sta to standards on asylum procedures, on reception conditions, etc., uh, and move away from the current sort of minimum uh, harmonization levels, so that also the reception uh, systems and procedure systems become more equalized across Europe. And then finally, this can be complemented uh, by increased operational support, uh, amongst others, and that already is moving in the right direction. Uh, for instance, from the part of EASO, as well as strengthened and more centralized financial support and, uh, and other kinds of support. I mentioned this as the last element. I don't think, as already mentioned, that we should do this instead of taking on refugees. Nevertheless, it's an important element of providing a holistic solution uh, to the situation. I hope I still have time for my second scenario. I'll try to keep it shorter, but it's, a, it's an important one too. It's one that increasingly is gaining ground uh, and it amounts to making access to the Schengen zone conditional on cooperation within the Dublin system. It has not been circulating as long as the flexible solidarity ID or at least not explicitly but of course the logics are not new and could come across as sort of intuitively uh, sensible considering the history and that's also why I spent some time on, on that part uh, of Dublin as an instrument to offset possible security losses stemming from the establishment uh, of the Schengen zone and as we know those logics also defined uh, uh, how the problems in the Dublin system spilled over in the Schengen system so working around that logic could at least on first sight uh, be perceived as a good idea. Uh, and perhaps from that point of view, it's also surprising that at least publicly it was never uh, voiced before um, until very recently uh, French President Macron's uh, so-called Renaissance statement earlier this year on uh, March the 4th, in which he called for a rethinking of the Schengen area, stating, and, and now I quote him, that all those who want to be part of it, of the Schengen system, should comply comply with obligations of responsibility, that is stringent border controls, and solidarity, one asylum policy with the same acceptance and refusal rules. Um, the idea of making 
participation, participation in the Schengen Zone conditional on Dublin has since that speech apparently been gaining ground, both in public comments and that I can comment on, as well as in uh, policy circles in Brussels, notably in the European Council. Amongst others, Dutch Prime Minister Rutte has earlier this month stated that if Eastern European countries continue to refuse solidarity, they will need to start feeling the consequences in order to make them start feeling those consequences and in light as well of the value that those countries attach to their membership to the Schengen area, the Schengen zone needs to start, in his view, to start functioning as a political lever. And he added more detail in comparison to what Macron had stated. Uh, he highlighted that it was not possible to push push the countries out of the Schengen system or to expel them, because this would require a qualified majority vote, and, and he's correct there. Uh, and so what he contemplated instead, and reportedly he stated so, uh, together with the French and German state leaders, was the possibility of jointly reinstating border controls along all of the borders separating West from Eastern Europe, so crossing the country continent north to south. In short, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth kind of uh, policy uh, idea. I would say, and contrary to the underlying theme of Macron's speech, where the idea was first advanced, i.e. providing a European Renaissance, this would amount to the opposite of what a European Renaissance would look like. It would instead be the start of, of reinstatement of East-West divides on the European continent that uh, until recently we were able to consider as a thing of the past. In addition to that, and also extremely problematically, it would be a clear violation of European law. Already at the moment, the internal border controls that are being upheld are subject to charges including by the European Parliament and by many analysts of constituting unlawful behaviour, first because their justifications do not live up to standards, secondly because it's questionable whether you can um, compile different legal bases as these member states have been doing. That's a bit of a technical discussion, but already they are on the edge of what is lawful behaviour and they might already be unlawful behaviour. If we started reinstating border controls fully from north to south, with as the main justification that they can serve as a political lever, it's fully clear to me that that would be a direct violation of the current Schengen Borders Code. And so on what basis then would the Western states enacting these controls still be able to claim and still hold the legitimacy to do so that the Eastern European states are not playing fair and are not doing their share? Um, so I think it would be the start of a slippery slope down towards power politics that uh, ride roughshod over commonly agreed rules and that do not promote, actually counteract uh, a spirit of intra-European solidarity. In addition, the Schengen acquis is in my view way too valuable uh, to be instrumentalized in this way with the risk that the mechanism backfires. Eurobarometer surveys of the past years have shown that across the board EU citizens consider the Schengen free movement zone as the Union's <laughs> most important achievement, even more important than bringing about peace amongst the member states. So imagine if we lost the Schengen zone or if we had a really hollowed out version of it, what that would mean for the legitimacy of the European project as a whole, uh, both on the western side of the divide that is contemplated where the European project is under strain, as well as on the eastern side, where, according to polls, the majority of the population in those countries still supports European Union membership of their country, in spite of uh, successes to, uh, for such parties as Orbán's Fidesz party. So I'm very critical of the ID. What I do understand is, and what I think informs this idea is the frustration at not getting anywhere in the face of continued opposition from particularly the Visegrad countries. But what we should do there then instead, and if it has to come to a split between Eastern and Western Europe on this file, let's at least do so by playing by the rules. And there are rules that we can use for that. Those are the rules of enhanced cooperation, which would allow those countries who are sincere about their willingness to move forward, to move forward, and those countries who want to stay out, to stay out. Um, the rules are there on enhanced cooperation, they are currently uh, in Article 20 TEU and interestingly their first incorporation into uh, treaty law dates back to the Treaty of Amsterdam 1997-1999 uh, and that was done against the background of the accession 
that was going to take place in 2004, including the Fischer-Katz states that we have at the moment, and because of the foresight that with these, not particularly those countries, but with many more countries joining, it would become more difficult to find consensus to uh, make decisions, and we needed uh, more flexibility for those countries who want to move forward to move forward. Um, it's legally possible. Uh, according to the rules as they stand, which would require that at least nine member states would need to participate. That should not be a problem if uh, the Northern Western European states that say they want intra-EU solidarity uh, are true uh, in that sense. No member state should be excluded from the scheme, excluded from the scheme if it would want to participate. That should also not uh, cause a problem immediately. Uh, the Council would need to authorize the endeavour by means of a qualified majority vote. That should also be possible. And importantly, enhanced cooperation would need to be a measure of last resort, meaning uh, the legislation cannot be adopted through the usual decision-making rules, uh, which is also the case at the moment. It might be a bit more difficult there, because according to treaty law rules, we can actually vote on the Dublin reforms with qualified majority. That's not being done. Because of political consideration, the Council prefers unanimity. So technically, you could say it's not at the last resort stage, because if we would vote by qualified majority voting, we might still uh, be able to do it. But in the past, uh, there have been Court of Justice rulings in which the Court has shown that it's quite lenient in its interpretation of what constitutes a last resort state stage in legislation. So I think also here uh, we shouldn't have any problems. Um, that enhanced cooperation could take several formats, include several states. I would then end by stating that uh, ideally, and in my view, that enhanced cooperation would then follow the lines of what I highlighted earlier as an alternative to the flexible solidarity scheme, i.e. structural responsibility sharing, mandatory quotas, a degree of choice of refugees, joint legislation beyond minimum standards, increased financial operation supports, and uh, a degree of free movement rights. I hope we have given now a lot of ground for discussion. Thank you for listening. Sorry for going over time and looking forward to, to discussing this with you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. Um, you have gone over time, but I think it was worth it. Um, you've given a very comprehensive and rigorous analysis of how we've got to where we are with this whole problem. Um, and I particularly like the fact that you haven't just left it there with an analysis of the problem, but you've gone on to, to talk about the potential solutions as well, none of which is uh, ideal or problem-free, but that's what else is new. Um, I found it interesting that you come back to enhanced cooperation because as you said, the link between Schengen and Dublin was there from the start, and Schengen really was a kind of an early example of enhanced cooperation because it was a treaty drawn up between uh, a number of member states less than the complete number of uh, EC member states at the time. Um, and in fact, the reason that you, know, that you have the Schengen Treaty, which is outside of the EC framework as such, initially was uh, and you have the Dublin Convention, the original convention, which was an, an instrument between the member states, all the member states, is because the whole idea of possibly having border-free movement within the EC as a whole was still alive at that stage. And the whole debate was going on with the UK about whether it was sufficient to put all your eggs in the basket of external border controls in order to enable free movement to take place uh, border free within the, the, the EC area and of course Britain famously mm -hmm. held out against that idea and we mm -hmm. as part of the common travel area went the same road as they did. Um, I think it is, it is worth recalling that um, and, and you, you, you mentioned this yourself that, that uh, you know at the time the Dublin Convention it was a very different world as far as uh, asylum seeking was concerned. Um, and as you said, th there were no uh, overland uh, entries into Europe from likely problematic places from, from an asylum seeking point of view. There were no overseas except into, into uh, you know, regular ports. Or the, you know, there, there weren't the kind of things we've been seeing in the Mediterranean 
uh, unfortunately, in recent times. So you're, you're basically talking about controls at airports and, and you know, proper seaports. Um, and, you know, there were genuine concerns about asylum shopping at the time, particularly on the part of the better off member states, because if you could move freely once you got into the EU without any considerations about whether you could apply for asylum, the likelihood was that the vast majority of asylum seekers were going to move to the better off member states where they could expect a better standard of living. So I think there, you know, there is, there is a lot of background to the to the to the to the reasons for the for the for the rules in Dublin. But of course, it's been completely overtaken by by events, um, and not least since the Arab Spring and the and the and the Syrian War, but even before that, as you as, you, as you've also mentioned. Um, so. Um, I'd like to throw the floor open for questions, uh, comments, discussion at this stage. Mm -hmm. And just to say briefly before I do that, uh, if you do want to contribute, could you please just give your name and indicate if you're affiliated to any organization or group, please. Hi, uh, my name is Brian McNamara. I work in the European Migration Network, part of the ESRA. Uh, thanks, Marie, for the presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I guess um, my question might be an obvious one a little bit, but uh, I was just wondering if I could get a comment from you about uh, the problems that you're talking about in the context now of the election that we've just been. Are the solutions that you've talked about, are any of them more likely or less likely now? Um, the two big takeaways, I think, um, just in the context of Dublin, <coughs> from the election, for me at least, were that uh, we've seen an increase in Greens and Aldi, uh, the Liberals in the European Parliament, uh, and uh, the other takeaway being uh, that we've seen a uh, reinforcement of the policies uh, in place in Poland and Hungary, especially, and Italy as well. Um, so in that context, I'm just wondering, um, when we have an appointment, perhaps, of a compromise candidate as Commission President, for example, and um, Vestager is being spoken about now as possible compromise, sir. Are those kind of changes going to uh, make some of the solutions that you spoke about possible solutions uh, more or less likely? Thank you. Uh, it's an interesting question indeed. And, and one that I reflected on as well, and, and I followed, of course, the elections with great interest. I believe, however, th that the, the really where the weight of the discussion lies at the moment is still in the Council. We saw it in the past already that the Parliament was able to come to a common understanding of what the Dublin reforms had to look like. And the big question is now in that respect if uh, that Parliament report will still be upheld in the next uh, Parliament term, depending also on what the Committee of Presidents decides in, in that sense. Um, but for both scenarios, of course, the Parliament is important and, and the Council will have to look at the Parliament uh, for whatever moves it makes in this uh, respect, but I think at this stage the discussion is still very much council-centred and we're still not getting out of the discussions uh, between member states, so as elections are important, they're not immediately affecting, I think, the debate at this stage, but of course later on, if either of the scenarios becomes more dominant or, or any of the alternatives, then it, it would come into play again, uh, that remains to be seen. Yes. Um, my name is Mrs. Mike Kelly. I am the member of the Institute. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is um, with the Schengen uh, area court, in terms of people that the, the EU citizens who look like me, black EU citizens, where, where are, how do you have any assessment on that? How does that affect them? And the reason I'm asking you mm -hmm. is because I no longer travel free, especially on that area, because I'm, I'm traveling under the influence of being black. Mm -hmm. I find myself being questioned, my citizenship being questioned because of that. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of uh, the Dublin area, uh, the Dublin regulation. Okay, you you are saying you acknowledge that it's no longer working, but people are holding on to it. Um, 
on a comment, it suits people to hold on to that because they take less responsibilities. And uh, this, uh, this thing of um, fair share of responsibilities in terms of EU member states or how or the Dublin was um, created so that people wouldn't be going around shopping for asylum. Now it's going on the other way around. The EU member states are going around shopping for asylum seekers, which has got the characteristics that suits the country, and that is wrong. Mm -hmm. If we look at the things on the side of human beings instead of policies, mm -hmm. we look at the human suffering instead of policies. You make a point of uh, that uh, you think that uh, asylum seekers should choose where they go. I agree, as you're saying, it's very controversial, but we are where we are. And uh, this is globalization, and no, we cannot go back. Asylum seekers, I think there is a problem where they think people, asylum seekers, because they are called refugees and asylum seekers, they lack intelligence. And they don't have a free will, which everyone was given. They do. The circumstances doesn't allow them, but they do have that free will. On that respect, because of globalization, people should choose where they go, within boundaries, within rules. Every country has got its own rules. No one is stupid <laughs> enough to come and say to a country, I want things to be like this. We respect that. But sometimes when rules are made, are made as if people, because they are refugees or asylum seekers, they lack, they don't have intelligence, they do. And I think if we look at the things when the policies are enacted, look, don't, because those people who are enacting these policies are talking among themselves. And because their voices are heard among themselves, they start to believe that what they are talking about is right. But they don't look on the, pers on the other perspective. I think that's all. Yeah, yeah but you. interesting points, and, and generally, I, I, I I take them, and, and but uh, quick reactions to them. I think the first point you made was uh, questions on racial profiling in yeah. internal border checks, and it's true, they are happening, there are reports on them, uh, particularly problematically uh, amongst others at uh, German land borders. Uh, uh, there have been reports as well of racial profiling in uh, flights leaving from Greece to Germany, uh, and they are remaining under the radar, and it's it's really a problem. The only uh, newspaper that has seriously uh, reported on it, and, and uh, I would want to laud it, is the Financial Times, which uh, uh, gave uh, a full article to the, to the problem there uh, in the summer of 2018. And I continue monitoring the news. I might have uh, missed things here and there, but it's surprising, I agree with you, uh, that this is not receiving more attention uh, and that this is not being uh, more seriously addressed as well. Um, by other institutions. Uh, I also agree that shopping for asylum seekers, so the converse kind of logic is uh, equally problematic. We saw this uh, particularly happening, happening from the side of the Visegrad states. There are also uh, difficulties with the kind of, uh, even within the relocation mechanism, the ad hoc one that was adopted earlier, the kind of criteria that were used uh, for identifying the kind of asylum seekers that would be eligible for relocation. There are problems there uh, that indeed need to be addressed uh, as well. And then yeah, it was clear that, like I agree, that we should uh, take into account uh, asylum seekers' uh, free will or that we should allow for some degree of choice. It's only acknowledging the reality uh, that indeed people have their own ideas of, of where they want to go. And if we uh, think that that is not the case, we will just go for a system that, that will not work uh, and we will be proved otherwise by reality. Anybody else? Uh, hmm. Thanks, Joan. Thanks very much for a really interesting talk and a very interesting points that you made as well. So it's, it's good to kind of have a human being in the centre of this. Um, can, can I just tease through your solution, your, your mm. enhanced cooperation solution? Mm. Uh, so what I understood you to say was that um, the current border controls, internal border controls being introduced within the Schengen area are contrary to EU law and therefore wouldn't sustain, for example, the Commission or another state, presumably to Germany or whoever, to even come to justice. 
And yet you're suggesting that um, a, a core group of countries within the Schengen area would have to enhance their cooperation. So what you would have is a core group of countries, as I understand it from you, enhancing their own internal cooperations, but not being able to uh, do any external border controls as long as they were within the Schengen, border Schengen area. So it seems to me that that could be a problem. Um, and I wonder, would you like to address that? And then secondly, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, the core problem here is one of trust between member states. Uh, trust that countries will apply the rules correctly. Trust that countries will take people back. Those trust arrangements have broken down most fundamentally, perhaps, because of what Germany did in 2015, whether you agree with that decision or not. So the question is, are there any measures that can be taken to help enhance that trust uh, between member states? And I speak, of course, from the happy knowledge that Ireland is outside Schengen, so we don't, uh, at the moment, have this issue, and we can opt in as, 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 we, as we would. Yeah, very interesting points, and, and thank you. Um, indeed, I, I considered that as well, because that, that could be some part of a problem in my enhanced cooperation ID. Mm. Um, but how to address it, or at least part of the solution, is that enhanced cooperation would not mean going back on the previous commitments that is also prohibited. Mm -hmm. So uh, the current Dublin system in all its flaws uh, and the current Schengen arrangements as well uh, would continue operating vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the uh, Fisicat states as well, presumably them being the one outside of the enhanced cooperation. So I still think um, and so under the Dublin arrangements that will still continue to hold as they stand um, first of all there, there might not be many asylum seekers moving from uh, Western Europe to Eastern Europe if we look a bit at the figures now so from that point of view uh, there won't be difficulties in sort of continuing to having the, the border open uh, and then conversely uh, people moving from the east to the west, according to the Dublin rules, as they still hold, you would still be able to transfer them back to the east. Then you can also say, but to what extent uh, is this going to be feasible without border control uh, in the middle to check that? On the other hand, is this really going to be... I know my, my answer is fully imperfect, but is it going to change anything to the current state of affairs in any way? <laughs> It's really the, the flaw in my solution, so I'm happy you address it. But I, I still believe my, the solution is the better one. In comparison, uh, it's true that maybe in a way, uh, the, yeah, the Eastern states get away with it. They don't have to cooperate and they don't have to have enhanced rules, but they're currently getting away with it anyway. And the alternative is to not let them get away with it by making Schengen conditional on Dublin. And it seems that that is the dominant mode, but that is, in my view, problematic for the reasons I outlined. So within two imperfect scenarios, I still choose enhanced cooperation one. There might be a killer app within the enhanced cooperation that would cause the police to want to come in, of course. So that might be what you do. Maybe yeah, but to, not likely for the future, but yeah. 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 And yeah. how to increase trust. Um, Difficult, difficult to answer at this stage. I don't see any measures uh, because I think the, the situation is, is so problematic. Uh, I sometimes wonder uh, as well, particularly if I look at the Dublin and uh, the Schengen versus Dublin arrangements, to what extent also uh, the Northern Western European states, and also if you look at the shift in position of Franco German uh, in France and Germany, are uh, serious and true when they state that they actually really want to participate in an intra-EU solidarity uh, mechanism because we also know we're all looking at the Visegrad states who haven't done their share in the relocation mm -hmm. system but we also know that the northern and western European states didn't do so good either <laughs> um, and so I think it's also sort of time to drop the masks if possible and that would also be uh, something that would be achieved with worst case and has cooperation not getting anywhere um, so either it gets somewhere and <coughs> step by step trust is rebuilt with those countries um, in southern Europe and northern and western Europe slowly but surely within a system that excludes eastern Europe 
either this doesn't work, but then we also know where we stand uh, when it comes to the commitments of Northern and Western uh, Europe, and then th that completely changes the game again. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, lack, lack of trust or lack of complete trust has always been a factor in all of this, I think. I mean, even the, even in the architecture of the Dublin Convention, I think it, it's there. Um, it's certainly there in the fact that Britain stayed outside of you know, complete free movement, border free free movement, mm -hmm. uh, because the, you know they did have concerns about particular airports in Europe at the time, mm -hmm. which will be nameless. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions, Fiona? Just uh, an observation to agree with you that uh, just because numbers are down at the moment. I think the I think the the real question is, you know, to what extent does your scenario two with enhanced cooperation add on? To what extent does that address the problem in the round significantly better than the first of, first scenario would? I mean, I think that's the mm. question. Yeah. And I, you clearly believe that it would be an improvement on. On, on what's there at the moment, and an, an improvement on on the first scenario. Um, um, or are you are you saying yeah. it would be better than the first scenario? I think it would make things clearer in comparison to where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not super op optimistic about splitting Europe in in this yeah, in yeah. this way. Yeah. But if we're gonna have to move to a split, which is better than just continuing to do what we're doing now, uh, let's move to it uh, through in a, in a rule based way. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anybody else? Well, I think we're past our time for finishing, so uh, if, if, if there aren't any other questions, I'll wind it up there. I just want to thank you, Marie, once again for what, as I said, was a very comprehensive and a very searching uh, analysis of the problem which is a really really difficult one and there are no easy solutions I don't think you can be criticized for the fact that your your, your uh, attempts to come up with scenarios uh, you know had, had flaws in them I don't I don't think anybody could come up with a, with a, with a solution to, to, to deal with this that wouldn't have, have question marks or, or flaws uh, that could be raised about it uh, so I think it was it was very useful and I think particularly useful because you did go into the area of you know what might the, the road be to a possible solution i mean often when problems like this particularly really difficult ones like this are discussed uh you know we get all about what the problem is but nothing about what the solution is and i think it's it is very useful to to that you went in you took that further step and you know got into tricky territory really but it, it, it was well 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 worth doing it and i think any of the people here who are involved in this either on the government side or on the, in, an NGO side, you know, have lots of food for thought on the basis of, of your, your presentation and your responses to the questions and answers. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, Thanks. For you.